Capitol Report is a production of Senate Media Services. The Senate is back at work navigating a new normal through the pandemic. On this week's program, access to affordable insulin becomes law, and lawmakers weigh in on possible changes to protect voters this fall. Stay tuned for this and more on this week's Capitol Report. Welcome to this week's program. I'm Shannon Lurkey. The 2020 legislative session must conclude by Monday, May 18th. This week, Senate Majority Leader Paul Gazelka outlined plans for the remainder of the session. Folks, we are essential, and what we're doing is essential. And so I'm saying it's time to get back to work, but, but frankly, we have to do it differently. And so I, w I took a look through what are the things that we're doing to make our, safe, our, our workplace safe, because this is what each industry needs to be thinking about. How do we make our, our workplace safe? Today is the third time we've come together using social distancing. I only saw one or two people that got within six feet for a little bit, and I just said, six feet, six feet. You know, just reminding people, but as a rule, we're naturally now doing that. We limited access to Senate office suites and staff areas to the public. It's only by appointment now and only two at a time. Our building staff modified their cleaning processes, and we have hand sanitizer and, and sanitary wipes all over the place. Our employees have been working remotely, and many will continue to do so. Our committees are taking full advantage of Zoom to hold safe, interactive online meetings. And these are going to ramp up now through the weeks of April into May. We've advised older senators and employees and anyone, anyone with underlying medical conditions to stay at home and stay safe. Now, some will choose to come in, and that is their right, but we're encouraging people to stay safe. And we're following the other CDC and, and MDH guidelines on hand washing and social distancing. So we can operate the Senate in a safe manner and do our work, and that's the same thing that I see uh, as the process moving forward in Minnesota. What, what can businesses do to open up if they, can, if they can show that they can do safe distancing and, and follow uh, plans to ha have a cleaner environment, then it's time to let them get back to work. But all of these steps that we're taking are not going to stop the virus. I cannot guarantee that somebody in our Senate family will not get COVID-19. The governor even talks about the fact that a lot of people are going to get infected with COVID-19 and we're simply slowing the process so the peak is a little later. But the fact that that is a real risk that we uh, have to accept uh, should not alarm people. It's, it's part of what we're all going through together. But we're going to do the work of the people. So what is our top priority? COVID-19. And we're going to make sure that we're here to respond immediately to the things that the governor is asking for and then focus on what do we need to do for small businesses and finally the state budget. Those are our main things and the other things that we'll address, we'll take them as they come. We're going to work together. I, the, the bipartisan cooperation is very, very important. I see it everywhere and especially in the Senate. Also this week, a long fought initiative to provide both emergency and long term access to affordable insulin for diabetics passed the legislature and was signed into law by Governor Walls. It's about time. This bill took far too long to get here for no reason. What we're trying to accomplish is simple, which is to make sure that people that cannot not afford their insulin can get it. I'm glad we're here today. I'm glad we're going to pass a bill today. Uh, this bill will save lives, and I encourage uh, my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to vote yes. But I can't skip today and not reflect on how long it took us to get here and why it took us so long. There were so many times that I thought today was not going to be possible. We were never going to pass anything. When we first started, we heard that coupons would help people that the patient assistant programs were enough, and we were even told that it was Alec's own fault that he died. There was a bill that went through this body as an amendment that passed with overwhelming bipartisan support and then disappeared. It just disappeared. So today I'm glad that we have changed 
some hearts and minds on this issue. I met with a group in my, uh, in my district, and I had a, a diabetic uh, look at me, and she said, Senator, what you need to understand is that insulin to me is like air to everybody else. Insulin to her was like air to everybody else. What I have learned in my uh, short years here is nothing goes as fast as you hope, and some things take a little bit longer than that even. But what a, what a great day to celebrate that this is, is finally accomplished. And I want to remind people watching that the four bills that were worked on in 2019, in, in the words of uh, then Commissioner Lorry, none of them worked. They didn't work. They had gaps. Uh, either They just had gaps. They were not working. And, and so, uh, so I just I made a list. I just don't want to screw it up. But, but so you take a, the recipe as you... Uh, you add a little bit of Little, you add a lot of Howard, add some Wicklund, some Hamilton, some Pratt, Benson, Rosen, Jensen, and, and maybe me a little bit, and a whole bunch of other people whose names I forgot that are, well, and you have these two tragic deaths that horrified us, and I met uh, Jesse and, as he was lying there, and, and he was beautiful, and I and, uh, just swore never again. But even that took a long time. Thinking a special session. Remember, we talked about that in September. And, but now what we have is a resolution. And particularly thanks to Senator Jensen, who navigated through some of the most torturous waters of all. And, you know, and, and now we have a product that I believe will stand. Senator Scott Jensen has been credited with finding the compromise that pushed the bill over the finish line. I spoke with him this week. How did you come up with this breakthrough? Well, thank you, Shannon. Scott Jensen, it's good to be here. Basically, I went back to the basics. It was all about eligibility, a sustainable funding source, in a pharmacy distribution process. And what was really getting in the way was we were getting pushback from lots of different stakeholders, if you will. So I went back to the pharmacies in the communities, in the metropolitan area, and I said, how would this work? What would work best? And what pharmacies told me is, they said, get the product distributed from the manufacturers to us or allow us to use our own inventory, and then we will have our inventory replenished. Once we did that, once we pivoted away from having insulin supplies shipped to doctor's offices, which would not work, then everything started to flow. And I think the manufacturers started to realize that we were interested in getting this thing done. We were gonna figure it out. So I think that was a big piece. And then I think the other big piece was convincing the House of Representatives that what we needed to do was we needed to use the pharmacy manufacturers' own programs, which had value to be sure, but they weren't strong enough. They weren't ironclad. And we needed to define eligibility. We needed to tell the manufacturers, you need to reshape and tailor your programs to meet our needs. And if you do that, we can use some of the tools you've already had in place for years, and we won't need to have a $38 million fiscal note. So I think with the Senate pivoting, using the distribution through pharmacies, and the House saying, okay, we get it, we'll work through the manufacturers, it came together. So there's a short-term component, and there's also a long-term component to this bill, the 30-day emergency supply. How does that work? Essentially, you have to attest to meeting certain criteria. One, that you have less than a seven-day supply of insulin available to you. Two, that you're in need and you will not be able to afford it. Three, that you do not have access to a program that provides you your total insulin for a cost of $75 or less and that you're a resident of Minnesota. If you do those things, you will get a 30-day supply and the pharmacy may charge $35. That's up to them, but that would be your maximum cost for that and it may be less. And so then for the long term, let's say you get your 30-day supply, how does this new law then uh, assure that this person will now have a long-term access to insulin that they can afford? The long-term program calls for a very short application to be completed by the, by the patient. They will have access to the 30-day urgent program and they'll fill out an application and there's one additional requirement and that's that their income be less than 400% of the federal poverty guideline, which for a family of four would be slightly more than $100,000. Once you do that, you make an application to the manufacturer of the product that you use, and the manufacturer will get back to you within 10 days. If there's a hang up and you need longer than 30 days to get on the long-term plan, 
you get an additional 30 days for $35. And we've talked with the manufacturers and said, this is the way it needs to be. You need to fulfill these eligibility criteria. And if you don't, you will be in non-compliance and there are strict penalties for the pharmacy manufacturers in that situation. And I have been assured by the manufacturers that they can work within that context. Senator Jensen, I want to thank you for taking the time to talk about this process, and, and the bill will be signed today. Thank you. On Wednesday, Governor Walls signed the bill on Facebook Live. In a time of uh, pretty dark and some challenges, this is a real bright spot. So uh, I, I can't tell you how grateful I am we're here to, uh, to sign Alex Smith uh, Insulin Affordability Act in, into law. And uh, there's so many of you on here to thank. Uh, this was truly a... Uh, a celebration of good policy, a celebration of uh, grassroots activism and democracy, a, uh, a celebration of incredible statecraft uh, to, to continue to work together and, and find compromises that work for everybody. And, and for that, I am incredibly grateful. Capitol press conference, lawmakers and restaurant owners made the case for selling beer and wine with takeout orders. Minnesotans want to help their neighbors and local establishments. Uh, the popularity of the curbside to go uh, has been pretty strong and I think this is another way that Minnesotans can help their local business uh, partners and um, favorite establishments. This is a responsible, temporary and common sense way to show compassion and protect jobs and the economy. And we need to provide more of these types of relief to let entrepreneurial spirits flourish. Hard work and innovation of Minnesotans has provided us a high quality of life and standard of living. And we need to promote more businesses to operate. And that's how we will eventually recover in the months down the road. This bill will really definitely help being able to move a lot of that sitting inventory. Um, and it helps promote uh, um, the possibility of hopefully bringing back more staff, um, including uh, supporting my payroll that supports my family, um, as well as um, all of the great staff that we have down there. Without any type of assistance, once this pandemic gets behind us, the second problem will be, what do we do if 20% or 50% of the restaurants never were able to reopen because they ran out of money? I think this is just critical at this time for our restaurants in our communities. I have heard from countless restaurants in my community who are begging for this opportunity. As our uh, restaurant owners already talked about, the margins in this business are very small and cash flow is everything and they are struggling mightily and many of them have had to close. The takeout has been great. and. To all the members of the public who are doing takeout, thank you, it really matters, but it's honestly not enough. And so because they already have inventory of liquor and the margins there are a little higher, this would help with cash flow for a temporary uh, time right now while it's so desperately needed. Wisconsin's handling of its recent presidential primary has Minnesota lawmakers considering what, if any, accommodations should be made. I spoke with Senator Mary Kiffmeyer, chair of the State Government and Elections Committee. Do any changes need to be made to keep people safe while voting in the upcoming August primary and November election? Well, to be sure, we're going to want every single person to be able to vote in a healthy way and to keep things as normal as much as possible because we are looking out uh, quite a ways and we have August, which even at the governor's extension to maybe May or June, that's still two months after that. And a lot can change as we're finding out right now. But our goal is to work in a bipartisan fashion as Minnesota has done for many decades to do those things that we can agree in a bipartisan fashion uh, to adjust timelines where needed, to make some adjustments on polling places, to make some other changes that we need to do. But we do it in a bipartisan fashion so that people have the confidence that everybody's voice is being heard in this election process. Poll workers are often older folks. Is there a desire to maybe 
make it easier for younger people to be poll workers or to reduce the number of polling sites or um, mail everyone a ballot. That Those are some things that I've heard proposed. Are you in favor of any or some of those? Well, the doing the vote by mail statewide has no support whatsoever amongst uh, our folks and folks that are that are with me in our caucus, the Republicans. However, recognizing that though, that some adjustments to some of the other ways, such as making sure that those election judges who are in the vulnerable population for whatever reason, they could be younger or older, but on their own be able to do that, and then putting out a call for all of our younger folks in that younger population area that are healthy and strong, that they will be able to join up. And that's one of the deadlines we need to make sure we adjust, that we allow for that recruitment, and allow for that signing up of that replacement election judges. Reminding you though, if you change things right now, my biggest concern is confusion. One of the things we saw in Wisconsin was confusion. The governor the night before said polling places closed, the court says no, they're open. You have confusion, we don't need that. So whatever we do, we need to put it in place, put it together in a very Minnesota common sense, reasonable fashion, and then implement the plan. And one of those things is to make sure we do have election judges, but the polling places were set the end of December. Those are the ones that people know. They have comfort, they know them, they know the people. We can do both. We can have wide-scale wide absentee voting as Minnesota law currently allows 45 days before Election Day. That is one of the longest in the country. So realizing Minnesota already has very good law in place for this and then having the polling places for those who want to go there and to make sure that we don't have confusion because in that confusion you can lose ballots. You can lose them by the fact that people are unsure, they don't know. And I've worked as an election judge for a mail-in voting uh, election and all of us as election judges said uh, we're not going to do this again because it was so confusing to people because we're used to a certain way. When you have good law already with some adjustments, we can do both. We can do them safely and we can do them by protecting people's health. You've been hard at work to establish provisional balloting in Minnesota. Why is this important? Well, provisional ballots enable voters to have equal treatment. So when you pre-register, a lot of folks don't know this, when you pre-register, you go through a rigorous check of validity as your, your registration is an application and it goes through verification. However, there are those who 21 days before election day or on election day, they cast their ballot, it's counted and cast, but only afterwards is it verified for eligibility. That's unequal treatment of voters. I want voters to be treated in an equal way, no matter when they cast their ballot. And that is what provisional ballots do. Make sure that you are able to cast the ballot, but that all voters have equal treatment in regards to their verification. I have not lost my desire to see that because I think it is sound public policy. 47 other states do provisional ballots, 47. So I think that it's time for Minnesota to do this as well. Will it be done this year? We'll wait and see about that. However, in the meantime, my biggest focus is during this COVID crisis type situation that we focus on the basics in our election system and keep an eye open for anything we can do to improve. One more question. Uh, prior to the pandemic, there was much concern about foreign interference in the upcoming election. Is there still cause for concern? Well, personally, I think you ought to always be concerned. We all know that it's when you take things for granted that bad things can happen. So we don't want to have a situation where we let down our guard. But what we did do last year is the Secretary of State got a lot of money, many millions of dollars of money, around $6 million or so. And so that amount of money was targeted specifically to his office for cybersecurity. Even prior to that, Minnesota law required the Secretary of State to keep the system secure. That's already his duty and responsibility. Then we provided that money over a year ago, about a year ago, I should say, to be more accurate. And so he has the resources that he needs to do it. All right, Senator Kiffmeyer, thank you so much for your time. You're very welcome. Glad to be with you, Shannon. And I'm looking forward to another high voter turnout, successful, healthy election in Minnesota.
uncertainty of the pandemic's length is prompting some states to consider enacting vote by mail. Washington, Oregon, Colorado, and Utah already do. Senator Nick Frentz supports the concept. You, Representative Jamie Long and DFL party chair Ken Martin announced a proposal called Defending Democracy last week that would make some changes to how people cast their ballots. What is it that you're proposing? Well, first of all, Shannon, thanks for having me on again. Greetings from beautiful North Mankato. Our plan would allow for every Minnesotan to vote by mail. It would require the state to send a stamped envelope to registered voters. It would send a registration form to eligible unregistered voters, place ballot boxes outside polling places and government buildings, and basically make it easier for people to vote. This is a primary response to COVID-19. As we saw in Wisconsin on Tuesday night, we do not want to put Minnesotans in the position of having to choose between their constitutional right to vote and their health. And this plan would do that. A recent Reuters poll said that 72% of Americans would like the option to vote by mail. And as you probably know, the state of Washington, in a bipartisan move, went to mail-in voting, and they're having sensational results and had the single highest presidential primary turnout in the country. Now, let's say nothing is done and the election, the August primary election, the November election go forward as if we're not in a pandemic. Is there anything to prevent uh, voters who consider themselves vulnerable or simply just don't want to go out and vote to request absentee ballots? It's a great question. I think the answer lies in the fact that we want to make it easier. Can people still request an absentee ballot? Yes. Yes, they can. But if we make it as easy as possible for vulnerable Minnesotans, Minnesotans with disabilities, where I live in Southern Minnesota, townships have only got mail-in voting. The more we make it easier for people to vote, the more people that will vote. The more people that vote, the more the result reflects the will of the people. That's democracy, don't you think? So also in your proposal, there is um, something about allowing people and community organizations to assist voters to collect and deliver sealed ballots, also about Minnesota's 11 reservations to allow people to serve as witnesses, even if they don't have a street address. Why are those elements important? I think they're important because again, we want to make sure that any Minnesotan who wants to vote can vote. People that assist sometimes find Minnesota voters that want that assistance. Uh, reservations historically have had challenges getting votes made and votes counted. We want to make it easier for everybody. We want it to be something to be proud of. And we want to keep Minnesota as the number one voter turnout state in the country. And I think we can do it with those proposals and the rest of the plan. And how can you be assured or assure Minnesotans that if any of these changes were implemented, it would not increase incidences of voter fraud? Well, I think that's the number one question Minnesotans should be asking, which is, are we still going to have confidence in the election results? And I would point to the many great townships in Minnesota that are successfully running mail-in voting without any problems with fraud. Over 130,000 Minnesotans already vote by mail. Down here, again, in southern Minnesota, countless townships vote by mail-in only. We never hear of fraud. Uh, we will not have any greater incidents of fraud than they do in these townships down here or in the state of Washington where they are working just fine. I respect the right to be guarding against fraud just like guarding against cyber hacking into our election structure nationally. But the fact is, there is no evidence that fraud occurs with any greater frequency on mail-in than it does with in-person voting. Senator Nick Frentz, I want to thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Shannon. Symmetry, functionality, and beauty were essential components of architect Cass Gilbert's aesthetic. Historian Brian Pease explains how these concepts come together in the grand second floor of the Capitol. The second floor of the state Capitol is really the focal point of all of the activity that happens here. What was Cass Gilbert's idea behind this particular design? The uh, second floor is really called the grand floor of the Capitol because it's where everyone can come up here, get access to the chambers, the House, the Senate, and the Supreme Court. And it's a place where all that activity is taking place each day of session. So you have people lobbying for interest groups here. You have the public that are here to talk to their legislators and so forth or go to the Supreme Court for their hearings. 
So really, the, the envision that Cass Gilbert had for this uh, space in the second floor was to be a grand space where you really get a sense of the, the architecture, these beautiful colonnades of Italian marble column and Minnesota stone, and you also get a place where people feel friendly or welcoming into those spaces as at the same time they're visiting or coming here for business. In the other capitals I've visited, I've noticed that the House Chamber is often across from the Senate Chamber, but not here in our capital. What is the reason for that? Well, I think what Cass Gilbert was looking at doing is creating a, a symmetrical building. And so we have, in 1905, there were 63 senators, not the 67 we have today, but we had 119 House members. So that's almost twice the size. So I think for him, how you construct a building with one end of the building with a smaller chamber and the other opposite end with a huge chamber just doesn't fit architecturally. So he put the Senate chamber on the west side of the building, the Supreme Court, a smaller chamber of course, on the opposite end and then the house because of its size fit perfectly in the north corridor or the north side of the buildings. It may just be a matter of folklore but I've read that the placement of the house chamber looking at the city of St. Paul is important in terms of representing the people, that the speaker is looking at the people. Is that true? Yeah, and that, that's a lot of people look at the, the way the uh, spaces have been designed or laid out, uh, that Gilbert was looking at the house being kind of the approachable. It's more of the people's house. The members serve a two-year term, so there's more rotation or more changeover as uh, members leave or get uh, re-elected or not re-elected. And there are more of them. And there's more of them as well. And so the idea is, it kind of symbolically, it faces the public, faces downtown St. Paul. In 1905, when the Capitol opened, the cons all of the state's constitutional offices were housed in this building, and that's not true today. Can you talk more about that? Sure. The uh, whole idea of the building here was, this is the seat of state government. So you have your executive branch officers, you have the governor, lieutenant governor, the state treasurer, the state auditor, the uh, secretary of state. Uh, the Attorney General all housed within this one building in 1905. And that gives you a sense of how this building has changed over its 112 year history because you have uh, a lot of those constitutional officers moving out to different chambers. They're going into uh, the state office building back in the 60s and the 70s. You had the administration building where the treasurer moved into it. Now the treasurer, we as a constitutional amendment, abolished the treasurer's office so there no longer is a treasurer's. And that also fits in with the, the history of the Supreme Court too. They uh, were, until the 1990s, uh, everything they had here, the offices, the law library, the chamber was their headquarters, kind of their center gathering place for all the work and all the business they do. And then when the uh, Judicial Center was open, they moved there. And so they have new uh, Supreme Court and appellate court offices and also uh, chambers there. But they still use this space in the state capitol as an important part of their connection to this building. Join us again next week as we delve into more topics affecting Minnesotans. I'm Shannon Lurkey, and on behalf of all of us at Senate Media Services, thanks for watching.